All right, welcome to Audubon Society of Central Arkansas's monthly meeting. This month's speaker is Bill Holloman, who has worked for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission since 2000, first as grants coordinator and zoologist, then chief of research, and now as their director. Bill is an avian ecologist with over 25 years of experience in science and conservation. He has a bachelor's in biology and a bachelor's in accounting, both from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, as well as a master's in biology from New Mexico State University, where he was studying crossbills, red crossbills. He helps manage Arkansas's red cockaded woodpecker population, and that's what he will be talking about today. Take it away, Bill. Thanks, Dan. It's uh, great to be with everyone. And let's see if I can get this going here. Uh, right. Sure, looks like it's working. Everybody see that? Yes, I can. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, again, I work for Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and we are, we are a small state agency. Our mission is protecting the state's rare plants, animals, and natural communities. We do that through a couple of primary methods. We have our, our, our heritage program, which is our research section where we collect data on the locations and, if, and provide inf uh, collect information on rare species and that goes in a database and we provide that to other users. Uh, we also use that to guide our system of natural areas. That is what needs to be acquired, what needs to be protected and how we manage it. And we have 77 natural areas now. I think it's, seven, it's over 72,000 acres. I think that's right, or maybe seven, I should have looked it up, sorry. Anyway, it keeps growing and we keep adding to it, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the work we do where we are protecting pine flatwoods habitat and where we are, are working uh, on red cockaded woodpeckers, which is an endangered species. So I'll give you an introduction on the red cockaded woodpeckers. I'll talk about their ecology, management, some monitoring doing, translocations where we physically move birds from one spot to another to augment populations. I'll talk about some of our natural area populations and conservation in general. And again, that's uh, I'm with Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. We are an agency of the uh, division of Arkansas Heritage, which is a it is a division of the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism. That, that's a mouthful, but anyway, it is. So I'm going to talk about the red cockaded woodpecker, uh, Dropides borealis. The genus name has changed in the last few years. It used to be Picoides. I'll be talking. I'll be referring to it as RCW hereafter. Um, it's a small bird. It's a little larger than the downy woodpecker, which is commonly seen in backyards and parks. It's termed the red cockaded because the red on the heads of the males resembles a cockade, um, which was uh, it, it, the American insignia of rank in the colonial army. It was the pearly finance colonial army often used colored feathers as an insignia of rank. So some, uh, now that I've said all that, the, nat the naturally the red cockade is most often not visible. So usually when you see a bird, uh, and only the males have the red cockade, but it's usually not visible. So typically you can't tell um, what sex the bird is. So just some stuff on the identification of the bird. They had this large white cheek patch, and then they had this ladder back appearance on their back. They lack the white area down the middle of the back, like a downy woodpecker or a hairy, hairy woodpecker, which is in the same genus. The adult has a completely white cheek patch, whereas the subadult, which are birds that fledged early in the year, they hadn't gone through their first moat, you can see that it has this diffuse black area in that white cheek patch. The males do have, you can see here, the, the red cockade, but it's under muscular control. They typically don't show it. Sometimes interactions with other males does show it. Um, or sometimes interaction with females. Young birds have a red, the ma young males, the young subadults have a red cat, cat. And you may have noticed uh, downy woodpeckers coming to your suet faders and sometimes they'll have a red cap. That's, those are young male uh, downy woodpeckers. So that entire genus, you see that same pattern that the young males will have a red cap until they go through their first moat in the fall. And over here on the right, you can see 
in the white cheek patch, it has the diffuse black. It tells us it's a subadult, a Burton Fledge that year. You can barely see it, but there's a, there's a, has a red cap. And so that tells us a male. So this is a young, it's a juvenile uh, male, red cockaded woodpecker. On the left, we see one bird that has, it is showing the cockade. And so we know that's a male. And down here, we see one that does not have the cockade. And people often want to jump and say, hey, that's, that's a female. Well, it might be. But one thing to remember is that these birds occur in family units. Uh, they often have one or two helpers, and those are usually males. And so this may be the female or it may be a helper male. This is a distribution map. of It's, a, it's an old map, but it kind of really shows well where it occurred across the country. The yellow is where it occurs now, although that's a little outdated too and the blues uh, historical distribution. So it's widely distrib distributed across the country. Uh, it's an endangered species. Population numbers have declined by over 97%. Historical population estimates are that there were one to 1.6 million groups. And so that's the family unit of the RCW. So, you know, that's uh, two to three birds per group. Uh, currently there are, this number is a little outdated, but it, it's 7,200 plus family groups. So um, quite a decline, although that 7,200 number is a tremendous increase from where it was. The number of breeding groups has increased, for example, over the last, by about, by over 30% in the last 15 years. Some uh, work from, uh, some stuff from Doug James' book and Joe Neal's book on the uh, birds of Ar Arkansas birds, their distribution abundance. On the left, you can see what their distribution was. These open circles are where they were known from the late 1800s. So they were known from the Eastern Arkansas, uh, Ozarks of Arkansas and Missouri, Southern Missouri. And the solid uh, circles were where they were known from the 1900s through the early 70s. So you see quite a few counties in Southern and Western Arkansas, including Pulaski County. And then the one on the right, it shows the distribution in Arkansas in the late 70s and early 80s. And again, we still had birds uh, in Pulaski County at that time. And the squares show where they were the most abundant at, uh, during this period up until the early 80s. If we put that data together along with other data we've collected, these are the counties that are represented in Arkansas that are known to have had red cockaded woodpeckers at some point. And I suspect there are more counties, probably all the counties in the coastal plain and may, perhaps all the counties in, in the Washita's and more in the Ozarks. We, you know, they just blinked out before um, there was a closer scrutiny of those populations. And of course, we also have a population at Pine City Natural Area in the Mississippi Alluvial Plain. That's the only population anywhere within the Mississippi Alluvial Plain. Um, those were the counties, let me do that again. That, these are the counties, but this is where they are, uh, are known from now. So they no longer occur in this county right here. These are the, these are the actual popu populations that we know of now. Um, so the number of populations dwindled, but the good news is several of these populations are increasing in numbers thanks to habitat management. If we look at other things, one thing that's really interesting to me is this bird was listed as endangered in 1970, which was, I believe, three years before the Endangered Species Act came about. And then we look at numbers in the early 80s down here, we see that there were about 25 groups in the Washoe Nassau Forest. There were about 25 in Felsenthal National Wildlife Refuge. And then it says 239 elsewhere. So there were a few over by Pine City, but the bulk of these were in the coastal plain of Southern Arkansas. But over time, we see these numbers declining, um, all of them, um, especially this number down here. And one of the big reasons is, you know, Southern Arkansas, is industrial timberland. And so they manage for timber and not so much for biodiversity. But one of the interesting things I just wanna highlight, even just a dozen years after they were listed as endangered, we still had quite a few birds in Arkansas. It was once considered 
one of the most abundant avian species in the southern pine forest. And of course, we can't say that now, but uh, we're trying to return it to that status. There was also work by one of Doug James' uh, students, uh, Fred Burnside, he put together this pamphlet showing uh, where some of the larger populations were. A lot of this work was based on active cavity trees. And again, you can see some of the larger populations were down here in the Ashley, Union County, Drew County, Bradley, and Calhoun County area. And this is where a lot of our efforts are going on right now. A lot of work has gone into the pine flatwood habitat planning as far as protection, as far as management, for example, the Nature Conservancy's eco-regional planning. And initially we identified protecting 60,000 acres of pine flatwoods on the Deweyville Terrace. And I'll talk about the terraces more later. We've now increased that target to 100,000 to account for protection of the ecosystem on the Prairie Terrace, which is the next terrace up. And it has a little richer uh, flora. And so Theo Witzel, our, our botanist, is really interested in getting more of that protected. And I also want to emphasize when we manage for red cockaded woodpeckers, we do ecosystem habitat management and not species specific habitat management. So we're managing for the ecosystem and it benefits that species. These are the terraces I talked about. So from this line over to here and south, all of this is the coastal plain of Arkansas. And I'm sure many of you know Millions of years ago, southern Arkansas was covered by a shallow sea and it deposited a great deal of sand. So um, this area became, once the, the waters went away, you had these sandy rolling hills, we call the tertiary hills, sort of the tertiary time period, which was, went from um, about two to 65 million years ago. So a really long time period. We also had these two big streams that come out of the Washita Mountains, the Saline River and the Washita River. And they cut down and they create these floodplains. And over time, they, they abandon those and they create a new floodplain and so forth. And the abandoned floodplains are these terraces. Um, and so those are, we refer to those as the Pleistocene terraces. And the Pleistocene period is from 10,000 to about 10,000 years ago to about uh, 2 million years ago. And so I talk about this because my initial assumption was that the, these RCWs would be found mostly on the tertiary hills because those were sandier soils, better drained, um, and it probably would have burned more frequently and so forth. But if we take our heritage data, this is all of our heritage data and the yellow dots or where red cockade, the RCWs are known for them. And so this kind of beige color is the tertiary hills where I thought where the majority of birds were gonna be. And then the blue area is the lowest terrace, which is the Deweyville Terrace where most of our work is being done. And this area here is this pinkish color is um, the Prairie Terrace. There's also the intermediate terrace. I don't know why it's the highest one. It seems like it should be in the middle, but it's not. Um, anyway, so you can see that the majority of these yellow dots are actually on the lower two terraces, which was really interesting to me and very informative. Um, and so that helped informed us as far as protection for this endangered species. We were already doing a lot of work there. So we need to go ahead and continue focusing our efforts on pine flatwood habitat protection and management in that area for the ecosystem and for that species. I'm going to skip that. This is a map from the from the late 1800s. Just one thing I want to point out. Sometimes people, this is where Pine City Natural Area is out in this area. And at the time of settlement, there were about 500 square miles. That was a mosaic of habitat that included extensive amounts of loblolly pine forest. And so this is not an area that where people went out and planted loblolly like, like they tend to do in a lot of areas and displaced shortleaf pine or other site appropriate trees. This area, the loblolly pines are native. And in fact, initial, uh, initial genetic work suggests that these pines, these loblolly pines are slightly genetically different than other loblolly pine populations and probably because they're geographically isolated. So they, they've had some genetic drift. Um, more work to be done on that to determine just how much. But anyway, so we're protecting that site 
for a number of reasons, including these, what we call the Lost Ponds of Arkansas. Um, and then Don Bragg of uh, the, the USDA Forest Service, a great researcher, has done some work on that additional work, Sean, you know, documenting this um, distribution of Loblolly Pond historically in Monroe County of Eastern Arkansas. So when we talked just a little earlier about why, you know, the RCWs declined in Arkansas and, you know, the greatest numbers really we're probably from Southern Arkansas down here. Well, that's, that is the wood basket of Arkansas. It's industrial timberland. And, and due to the way they manage, you know, it's not intended, but over time, the, the, the appropriate habitat for RCWs declined. And um, in the Ozarks, what I understand what happened is that the railroads went through, they came through and they basically took out all the shortleaf pine for the railroads. Um, I don't completely understand why they declined so much in the, in the Washita's, but the good news is, is uh, thanks to great work by Warren Montague and his staff, they've really rebounded well. Um, and so anyway, and then in Eastern Arkansas, where Pine City is, where there once was an extensive area, that is the breadbasket of Arkansas. And in that part of, of Monroe County, where there were pine trees, that's where that land was a little higher and the pines did well, and so a lot of those pines were cut down. And now you have soybean fields and rice fields and so forth. This is a map of, of uh, our focus areas. We use our data, like I talked about, in expertise, and we determine areas we want to focus. So south and down in South Arkansas, down here, this side, this side, down in here. We're doing a, a focus on a lot of efforts on pine flatwood habitat protection and management. And we also have what we've talked what we've uh, talked about or, or label as facilitation corridor. So you can see this kind of color right here that goes from the Washita's down the Saline down to the state line and then same way up um, the Washita River. So if, if something comes available and it's not within one of our focal areas, but it helps facilitate um, establishing movement of species north or south in response to environmental changes, we might more strongly consider acquiring that property. And in fact, in time, we will be looking, you can see we're, we're creating these stepping stones. There's Felsenthal, we own area down here at Huddy Pine Flatwoods now, then you've got Longview Saline, now you've got Warren Prairie, you got Hawk Creek Barrens, you got Kingsland Prairie. So we're creating this stepping stone corridor where birds, so you can have the rescue effect between populations, but you can also facilitate the shifts in distribution, for example, uh, perhaps to climate change if things needed to be moved north, and this would help uh, facilitate that movement. So I want to get into the ecology of the RCW. It is a specialist adapted to a fire maintained southern pine ecosystem. The RCW is adapted to open mature pine forests of the southeastern United States. This open grassy condition was historically maintained by frequent fire. And by frequent, I mean every two to four years or so. And the fire is critically important for RCWs. The frequent large scale fires are required for RCW success. So they do a number of things. It, first of all, it reduces hardwood midstory. The hardwood midstory shades out native ground covers. The hardwood midstory also provides substrates for rat snakes to reach their cavities, and rat snakes are their primary uh, predator. They will take eggs, nestlings, and adults. And it also reduces the amount of foraging for substrate, and I'll show you that in a minute. When it encroaches on the tree, on the pine trees, they will not forage along, along that part of the tree. It also, the fire also increases abundance and perhaps nutrient value of insects and other arthropods. And this is referred to as the calcium hypothesis. Uh, and so the uh, a researcher, Fran James, um, hypothesizes that a lot of the calcium is, is um, gets built up into the shrub layer and so forth. And if you release that, then it, it can be, uh, made available to the, to the woodpeckers in the form of the insects 
that the birds eat and that helps with egg formation and so forth. Uh, we do know that there's a, that is a hypothesis, but nonetheless, uh, it's certainly a, a, an interesting one and one that, that Fran James has some data to support. Um, we do know that there's a two to seven fold increase in insect densities in this type of habitat with fire and that insect densities are negatively correlated with percent coverage of woody vegetation. And that's likely because the more coverage you have, the woody vegetation, there's less sun hitting the ground, and then there's less of an herbaceous layer, which in, in turn supports that herbaceous layer, supports the insects, which have part of their life cycle on that herbaceous layer and part of their life cycle on the trees where the birds forage. And indeed, there's a strong correlation between native ground covers and insects and other arthropods that RCWs feed on. So this is a tree that they can forge on where there is no uh, hardwood mid store. And you can see basically they can forge on the whole tree and all of the branches. But if you get some hardwood mid store, it reduces that. And you might look at it and say, well, that's not that much. But if you reduce that, you know, that for every pine tree per acre, and there's going to be probably 25 or so large pine trees per acre, and their, their territory sizes are large. They require about 125, 150 acres of habitat. It depends on habitat quality. The more they have of this hardwood encroachment and the less quality foraging habitat they have, the larger territories they have to have. And so keeping these, you know, the burning going helps keep the hardwood encroachment off the trees and helps maintain high quality forging substrate for the RCW. Another thing uh, important, they excavate in live pines. And this is possibly an evolutionary response to the lack of snags and hardwoods in a fire maintained ecosystem. Um, there are three primary pines that are used, the longleaf pine, shortleaf pine, and loblolly pine. The longleaf pine does not occur in Arkansas. These are natural cavities that the birds have excavated in the trees. And I think both of these are at Pine City Natural Area. They excavate in older pines, usually greater than 80 years of age because of a higher frequency of red heart fungus. And th these pines typically start getting red heart fungus around the age of 60, uh, but they get a lot more of it when they get older, especially 80 years and older. Um, and they, the RCWs preferentially select pines with decayed heartwood for their nest and roost trees. You can see here's a conch that, and, and uh, will provide the avenue for the uh, red heart fungus to get in the tree and it helps decay part of that, that uh, part of the tree. And so the excavation of a cavity can take anywhere from a few months to several years. And the length of time is influenced by the amount of red heart fungus and the width of the live sapwood and the amount of pitch. Thus cavities are a very limited resource. So this, this is the heartwood here. So if you have, if it has red heart fungus, it can decay that part. It'll make it somewhat spongy. When they go through the sap wood, it takes quite a while. And basically, uh, I'll so, show you a couple of pictures in a minute. And it looks like they're just getting dust off of that. Uh, um, and, um, and, but once they get to the middle, they will, they can start getting chunks out and it'll go faster. And this width, you know, if, Sometimes they uh, they they can find a, a tree and they can find it where it has red heart fungus and where it has uh, narrow sapwood and they can get in there and make a cavity more quickly. And this is a picture of a natural. This is a you know the tree's been cut so you can see the inside of the tree and you can see it makes the cavity goes slightly up like that and that is thought to help reduce the likelihood of rain going down the tree and going in the cavity. So we talked about, um, you can see here, it just looks like sawdust. This is a bird that's been working on this and they'll work on a cavity for a while, and, but they'll have to come back because um, sap is coming out. It's also called pitch. You know, they call it pitch because it pitches the beetles out, but it also pitches the woodpeckers out when they're making cavities. And so they'll work on it and they'll have to come back when this hardens up some because feathers and sap doesn't work well. Um, and you can see there's, there's that, and this is a, a bird at, uh, at uh, Pine City several years ago, summertime, and you can see, you know, it's it's really there's no big chunks coming out of there on the work it's doing. It worked on that cavity probably for 
four years before it finished that. We have them cases. We had one at Warren Prairie this year. It took about a year, but usually there it's 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 longer than that. And so cavities, like I mentioned, are a very limited resource, and so a lot of things want those cavities, especially other woodpeckers. They'll come in and enlarge the entrance. Um, pileated woodpeckers, red-headed, red belly, red belly woodpeckers, and that's called cavity kleptoparasitism. So really nice term to just throw out there. But basically it means that they steal the cavity from them. And so one of the things we will do management-wise, we'll come out and put these metal pieces on, and we're called restrictor plates, um, and it'll keep other woodpeckers from blowing that hole out larger and stealing that cavity from the, from the RCWs that just spent three or four years making it. Another thing you'll notice is going on here is there's a lot of sap going down. So these birds injure the tree above to the side, below and on the back side of the tree and sap flows down and that deters rat snakes from getting to their cavity. If they have sufficient sap flow coming out of these sap wells, when the rat snakes hit that, they just fall right off the tree. So uh, really ingenious and interesting. One thing I noticed on this, some photos I took, when they do the sap wells, they start off from the side. So this is a, this is a sap well that's to the left of the, the, the cavity. So the bird is over to the side of that. And you see, so it's working from this side. And that one of the things that does from working from the side, it keeps the sap from getting on its tail feathers and other feathers. You can see it also has its eye closed. Then it's got a piece out. And, it's, and then it's kind of eyeballing its work. We go to the other side of the tree, it's just the reverse. It starts, you know, so they don't start from the inside, you know, close to the cavity, they start from the outer part of, this, of the uh, sap wells and go inwards. And again, you can see its eyes closed. You can also see its, its um, color bands. So, so, we, so they make, they, they have these sap wells and when we get in the nest, nest season, they really work these trees up. You can see they, they do a couple of things. They, they, they have all these sap wells, and they also flake bark off the tree. So where they don't have a lot of sap wells, or even above where they have all the sap wells, they flaked a lot of bark off. And that makes the tree slick. And that also makes it difficult for rat snakes. And, you know, we see another bird, another woodpecker that likes slick trees, and that's the redheaded woodpeckers. And it likes, you'll see it use a lot of snags where the bark is falling off. And those trees are slick. And that also makes it hard for the, the rat snakes to get up. So we have all these, but over on the right, we see a uh, bottom right, we see a tree where it's just been activated. Um, this was an active cavity trees and we went out there, this was in Louisiana and we watched a rat snake go 25 up, feet up the tree and right into the cavity. It's kind of interesting to watch. But one of the things they don't use are um, SNEDs, snake excluder devices. So you can put this aluminum flashing around the tree and you can put staples on there. You have to make sure the staples are up and down, not parallel to the ground. If they're parallel, the rat snake will use that as a, as a ladder to get up. Um, that's work that Joe Neal worked out. Um, anyway, so this will help deter them. It's not, uh, it doesn't completely keep them going, but mostly keeps them from going up the cavity tree. One thing they will do to get around this is they'll go to the next tree and they go across branches and then come down a tree. So the rat snakes are pretty persistent. So because of the excavation of a cavity can take anywhere from a few months to several years, cavities are a very limited resource like I talked about. And, and thus we end up with these cooperative breeders and which is like a response to ample resources for survival, but a scarcity for breeding. In this case, cavities for breeding. And thus they generally occur in breeding groups and you, you will have three to four birds oftentimes, although you do have plenty of breeding groups that don't have helpers. Um, and the area they roost and breed in is referred to as a cavity tree cluster. They used to call those, um, I can't remember the other term now, but um, they call it cavity tree clusters. Another thing to note, they're short distance dispersers and they flourish when groups are highly aggregated in mature open pine habitat, but they flounder when groups are broadly spaced across the landscape. And, and thus they're termed demographically isolated in that case. And they, they will flounder even when the habitat is in good shape. And that's because they're shut, such short distance dispersers that if a breeding adult dies, it's unlikely to be replaced by another breeding adult. And thus over time that, that, uh, that group just blinks out. So we'll talk about Warren Prairie later. This is in Southern Arkansas. 
where we've done a repatriation project with RCWs that had completely disappeared for two, two or more decades. And we've been uh, translocating birds to there. So when we did the planning, um, we initially just had 10 clusters and we had them, you see these first five here and then six through 10, highly aggregated, about a half, just a, just a tad under half a mile apart from each other. So uh, close enough, you know, since the short distance dispersers, but not so close that they end up fighting all the time. And because it takes several years to excavate a cavity, young males often either remain in a territory and hope to inherit it or disperse in search of a vacant spot in an existing cavity tree clusters. And new territories are created at a low frequency because RCWs are more likely to compete for existing cavity tree clusters. This can lead to slow population growth and make recovery of populations difficult and frustrating. But two intensive management methods have been used to deal with this, this problem. Artificial cavity construction to create new cavity tree clusters. So if they won't go a half a mile over and create a new cavity tree cluster, we will do it for them. And then also translocation to move individuals or pairs to unoccupied ter territories. Since they are such short distance dispersers in populations where there are extra birds, we will get those and move them to areas where we can augment those populations. And so when we put in a, a cavity naturally, you climb up a tree with a chainsaw, you cut a hole in it with a chainsaw. Uh, this is Joe McGlincy, he's since retired, but he used a tree stand. Most people use ladders, um, Swedish tree climbing ladders. This is Warren Montague, one of the heroes of RCWs in Arkansas. He's up on a tree. These are called cavity tree insert. I mean, these are called cavity inserts because you cut a hole in it, then you insert it in the hole. <laughs> Then you shimmy it, spray paint it, you know, put some putty on it, and uh, boom, you've got a cavity that they will instantly use. Um, but once you get the cavities in there, there's still work to be done. Uh, the artificial cavities, you know, everything, there's over 20 species that compete for these cavities. Bluebirds, um, uh, red wasps, uh, dirt daubers, I've pulled tree frogs out of them, and so forth. There's other bird species will nest in there. Um, and then where we have the natural cavities, like so you have to climb up and we often put uh, these restrictor plates on though, not always. But the big thing that competes for those cavities are, are southern flying squirrels, cute little things. And we try to, when we remove them, we try to catch them and relocate them quite a ways off because they'll home back to those areas. Um, but they can really cause a, a lot of problems for, for RCW sites. And then, of course, we have to have good habitat. And with suppression of fire over decades, you've had a densification of trees. And so you have a higher number of trees in the habitats that they used than what you had historically. And I talked about the importance of the herbaceous layer. And what you see here is no sun hitting the ground, and thus you have no herbaceous layer. But we know, we know how to get it in good shape. And so we have done that. Here's an example. We went from that to this, and you see this rich herbaceous layer, and then you see all these large trees. And I sometimes <clears throat> like to kind of kid, but it, it's kind of accurate that RCWs are really a grassland species that need a few large uh, pine trees in their habitat too, although it's probably about 25 per, per, per acre. Um, so how we get there, the number of different ways. So we, we use timber harvest. Uh, is one me method. We also use what's called a forestry mulcher or grinder or masticator. And you can see here the, the canopy tree structure is good, but the mid story is covered up. We come in and you end up with this. And I do, again, want to, this is an opportunity to emphasize that we do ecosystem management. So if we were just managed for RCWs, we might get rid of all the hardwoods. And you can see we have what we consider to be side appropriate number of pines and hardwoods. The, the, the grinder folks we worked with did a great job. And over time, you working with us and others, they graduated to much larger equipment. In fact, we just finished about $49,000 worth of this work at Pine City Natural Area, thanks to a grant Samantha Shaman helped us get. And speaking of Samantha, this is an area we went in with grinder at Pine City. This is cluster 15. That, that's Samantha right there. You can tell these are really big trees. And so we opened this up. You get this park-like understory. Uh, and then you have the habitat that the birds will use. And so you get the canopy structure you want, but you're still not done because, you know, the, this, this area hasn't been frequently burned for a long time. 
you have a lot of light seeded things that have come in like sweet gum. So we'll go in and we'll treat the sweet gum. We mostly use hack and squirt. So we don't have a lot of collateral damage, but we also do some foliar spray to knock the sweet gum back. If you don't, the sweet gum will completely take over. Um, and then a lot of Southern Arkansas is covered by young pine. So we don't have as much opportunity to do the stuff with older pine. So we've got to grow the trees older, but at that same time, we want to open that up. Those young stands are really a desert underneath. There's just nothing that uses those. Um, and even getting ready for pulp thins, which uh, you know what you do on the younger stands, we have done some pre-commercial thins. We did this over several hundred acres. Um, these were like 10 year old stands, 10 to 12 year old stands. And it was a desert underneath. We did this in the spring. I was out there when they were doing it and uh, immediately had, this was really interesting, really immediately had migratory uh, warblers uh, going through this habitat, which is really cool. But the big tool that we use is prescribed burn. That's what we tended his, historically, and that is our main tool. tool. And this is a, a crew from the Nature Conservancy. They're in a unit they, they burned a few weeks before or, or maybe a little longer. And on the other side of this fire line, you can see going across here, they have another burn going. And so that's something uh, we try to do on a two year timeline. When these flat pine flatwoods, it can get too wet sometimes and you can go every three years. But if you try to go every three years and you end up going four years, sometimes and that's not good. Uh, this is an example of how it can change over time. This was a gated area to get into this management unit. You had to open this gate and go to it to get into it. And then over time, it became the gate to nowhere. We eventually relocated this gate where it could be used in a more uh, effective manner. Um, but this, this is a really great site here. We have had woodpeckers in this site since the first year of our repatriation efforts. Over time, you can see as you do that work and you burn, their herbaceous layer is slowly getting better. Uh, this isn't the same exact spot, but you can see that the herbaceous layer really responds well. This particular site has a lot of little blue stem and some broom sedge in it as well and some other things. And it's, it, it's really in good shape. We've also planted shortly pine in some of the habitat we bought where the pines were really young. We just went in and burned those areas and then we planted with shortleaf pine because over time, these industrial timberlands have mostly replaced shortleaf pine with loblolly pine because it grows faster, especially the first 50 years. And so we're trying to get shortleaf pine better represented in this ecosystem. One other th quick note down here on the bottom right, you'll see this kind of this it's kind of a, it's a mound, we call these mound woodlands. And over the last uh, few hundred to several thousand years, we've gone through multi-decadal multi droughts where we end up having desert-like vegetation in the area. And when winds would blow, the larger soil particles, the, the sandy soil and the, the silty sand would accumulate around shrubs, create these areas. And these areas are better, better or they're better well drained and also the pH is more acidic. These mound woodlands have or where we basically the locations at uh, Warren Prairie where you can find uh, blueberries. So the blueberries like that acidic soil they grow on that. You take a few steps off of that you get onto the amy silt loam which is underlaid by clay no blueberries so kind of interesting. About 20% of the landscape at Warren Prairie is covered by these um, mound woodlands. One other thing we have there, we've done a little work on, I'm not going to talk about that all of it. As you know, feral hogs are a problem in South Arkansas and all the whole state. So I do want to get into talking about um, translocating birds, and we do that for mostly for augmenting populations. We also did it for repatriating a pop population at Warren Prairie, that's the only repatriation project that's occurred west of the Mississippi. And I think there's only been like three of them uh, throughout the range. So doing this involves translocation to move individuals or pairs, primarily sub-adults to unoccupied territory. So how do you know what areas need birds and which birds should be targeted for translocation? So uh, talked about, we had the RCW repatriation project at Warren Prairie, um, and I'm also, I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to give you a quick summary on augmenting the Pine City natural area or CW population. So this is where Warren Prairie is down here in Southern Arkansas. 
it's in Bradley and Drew County. The majority of it's in Drew County, but the uh, parking lot's actually in Bradley County. And we have been translocating birds to that site for 10 years. We're going to be doing another one in October of this year. Uh, in the future, we hope to get another population going here at Longview Saline Natural Area, which is now up to over 6,000 acres, about half of which is open pine habitat or will be once we get it restored. So when you know, you hear, why are you moving woodpeckers to a place that's called something prairie? You know, so um, the name prairie uh, is not completely accurate. We have these uh, saline soil barrens at Warren Prairie Natural Area, and it's a type of, it's a grassland type grassland habitat type. It's also referred to by some as a type of glade. And at this site, you have high levels of sodium and magnesium salts in the soil. soil. And also you have thin soils on top of a thick clay layer. And we're the, so if you have that, that's really hard for woody vegetation to grow. They don't do well with the salts where the salt levels are high and the, the uh, soils are thin, you get no woody vegetation growing. And where it's most extreme, where the soils are thinnest and the, those salts are the heaviest, nothing grows. And you see here a salt slick. And here you can see some desert vegetation right here. We have some uh, opuntia there. There's some uh, cactus growing there. On the edges of these, of these barrens, you get uh, uh, some oak trees, some stunted oak trees that grow there. And then you get into the uh, pine oak woodlands where the, the soils get deeper. So again, how do you know what, who is eligible to be moved and what area needs birds. And that starts, that work starts in the spring and we'll go out to the two areas and we will monitor birds. We have what's called a, a treetop peeper where we have an extendable pole where it sticks a camera inside a cavity and we can see what's in there. In this case, we can see there's two, two eggs. We come back later, there's three eggs. Great information because you want to ban the nestlings when they are six to 10 days old and we ban the nesting so we can identify individual birds which helps us monitor the population. So, you know, we come back or if you didn't get the egg information but you came out and you saw this, hey, this is hatch day, so that's day one. And you can estimate when you need to come back and climb the tree, pull them out to bring them down and put on this unique color band combination so that you can look later identify those birds through your binoculars or spotting scope. And to, to ban the birds, naturally you climb up the tree and you pull them out of the cavity. <laughs> so uh, this is Warren Montague. He's up about 50 feet here at Pine City, natural area. You'll see he has this uh, tube right here. Inside of it, we have, you'll have uh, three pieces of fishing line, about 25 to 30 weight, and you'll create these three nooses that come out this end and on this end you pull on it and you'll have a knot that you tie right around here so that you know that when you pull it, if you have a woodpecker in there, don't pull past that or you will choke it. So um, really scientific stuff. So then we pull them down and uh, we, we weigh the birds. We put, we put uh, a US Fish and Wildlife Service band on it and a color band. And I, one thing, I showed you the noose, how we noose them and when you stick that noose in there, and if you will cover the cavity, it, get, it darkens the cavity, just like if an adult was going in there to feed them. So these birds cannot see, you know, uh, they, do, they don't have good vision at this point until they're, oh, probably about 12 or 13 days old, they start getting decent vision. They, but they can detect light. So when the cavity goes dark, they know they're about to get fed, and they do this. And so if you put that noose in there, you hope you get it in the right place. You put your hand over the, the cavity and they stick their heads up and like that. And it goes through and you noose them and you pull them out. It, and that's hypothetical. It doesn't always work that well, but it works that well quite a bit. So another thing we'll go out later. So we have, we have bands on them, but it's good to know the sex of the birds as good as possible for, for later. And we will go out and we will peep the cavities when the, the birds are 20 days old. These birds fledge at about day 26. So you need to do it before uh, they get any older than that or you might accidentally force fledge them. But at this point we can go out and we see these red caps. And like I mentioned earlier, the young, the young RCWs, the males have red caps. We know both of these birds 
are, 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 are males. And so we know the color band combos for both of those birds, that's for males. We come out to this and we see this one has a red cap and this one doesn't. Uh, so it's a little bit of a problem and usually you won't know, but every once in a while you get a peek at the color band combo. We got it there so we're able to tell what the, this, you know, the particular color band for this is a female and what we know on that is a male. We're also getting information on the um, adults at that time. So they're coming to the nest frequently and feeding and we're getting the color combo on that. And that this is important because when we come back later, if we're gonna to try to get one of the young birds from there to translocate, if it's a male we want, we have to make sure that both the breeding adults and one helper male is, that, is there, or you can't take a male for translocation. So it's important that we know that information. Um, sometimes you don't, you don't have the liberty to get all that information, but you come out later, and this is a uh, pair that I got, uh, was able to uh, digiscope at Warm Prairie. And you can see that bird has a red cap. And then this bird shows me its color band. So a bonus. And we'll see that same thing here. Just another clip because it brought a big moth in. Uh, it'll look around. And uh, again, you can see when it sticks its head out, it's got a red cap. Come on, stick your head. Okay, anyway, there's, this is a, a still photo of the same thing. You can see the full color bands. This was a helper male this year. You can see the red cap on, on the nestling sticking out. Great information. You can't quite tell, but this male got a little mad at the nesting because it was just jabbing it, basically, hey, feed me, feed me. And it showed its red cockade, which is it's like, hey, back off, youngin. You know, I'm the boss here. So then we'll go out in the fall. So we'll go out to the spots where you're going to move birds from and where you're going to move birds to. So if you're going to move, if you're planning to move birds in an area, you need to make sure nothing has moved in on, on its own in there. Other, otherwise, you're wasting birds. You didn't, you didn't need to do that, bird, that movement of, of, with the birds. So we'll go out and we will go out at roost time. We'll get out there two hours before the birds go to their cavities. And we will uh, see uh, what's going on. Uh, on there as far as is an active cavity. And then the same thing goes for where we're going to, if we're going to translocate birds from a site, we want to see, do we still have the breeding pair? If we're going to get a, a male, do we have a helper male? And then can we find the bird we want to, to, to trap and move and which cavity is it using? That's very important. They're doing that in the Kasachi National Forest for us right now. They're doing that in the month of September. So we, I mentioned we move birds from the Kasachi National Forest. So we'll take off, oh, morning or lunchtime, drive down the Kasachi, get down there late afternoon, meet with them. And then later we will then drive to Warren Prairie and put the birds in the cavity. So we get down there and see the shadows are getting along. It's late in the afternoon. We meet with their staff. They tell us, you go out here. They're trapping most of the birds, but we also assist. This is Patrick Solomon. They tell us which tree a young bird that we should trap. And so we will go out, we will preset our pole. We got a telescoping pole and we got a hoop we've, we've created and we use a clear trash bag um, to catch the birds in. And so this is this was at Pine City, Brian Rupar and I were doing it. So, you know, they come in, you put, the, put it over that, you wrap on the tree and a lot of times they'll fly right into to your, your trap, but not always. Sometimes I have to climb the trees bang on the tree and occasionally I have had to stick something in the cavity and kind of prod them and eventually they typically will come out. I've only seen one bird not come out and um, we tried forever. It, fortunately, it was somebody else standing up in the tree, but uh, you can see they come down here. It is in the clear trash bag. Um, everybody uses something a little different. There's not an RCW store. This, uh, this is staff from Fort Polk who were just amazing to where we got three pair our first year. And they use netting um, with their telescoping poles. Uh, but nonetheless, then you get the birds out. Once you catch, catch them, you need to check their color bands and see, yes, this is indeed the bird I was trying to catch. Occasionally they will move, you know, they'll switch cavities and you don't want to take the wrong bird. So we make sure it is. If it is, then we put them in what's called a translocation box. We'll write down the color combo on the tag and the sex of the bird. And then those birds are really safe. It'll help keep them uh, nice and typically pretty, pretty quiet. Well, there's some personalities that like to be active the whole drive. 
but that's the way it goes. But anyway, so then we'll get to Warren Prairie and then I climb, you know, cavity. I've, I put most of them in the, in the cavities. I've had Warren's help a couple of times or one time, and he's going to help us again this year, thankfully. Uh, but, you know, you're climbing up, you know, several cavities in the night. We get up to eight birds each time. Uh, and then you stuff them, stuff them in the cavity, basically. And this is, uh, this is me doing this uh, a few years ago. Can you hear the bird squawking there? Yeah, most of the time they don't make noise, but I've had a couple of birds and this one's, this was one of them. Naturally, when somebody was, uh, Patrick Solomon was filming this, had a bird go off. But both times that I had birds go scream like that, I had an owl come in. This time a screech owl came in and the first year we did a translocation, I had a bird go off and a barred owl landed at eye level on a, on a branch on the tree right next to me. Brian Rupert put the light on it. Hey, Bill, look. So kind of interesting. Um, so I'm putting the screen on there. I put some push pins on there. You can see this is another screen, slightly different one. We'll put the push pins, it's got a string. It goes all the way down the ground. We'll come out around sunrise and we'll wait till the owls are done. Uh, especially, you know, the great horned owls are often still active and barred owls can be as well after sunrise and wait till the owls are done. And then we'll pull those strings off and you'll see a lot of times what, what typically will happen is the, the birds will start pecking on the screen like that. So they're ready to go. It's that time of day, there's, day, there's enough light. It's entering their cavity. They know it's good. You pull the screen off and the bird will fly out. And then it'll, it'll go socialize with other birds. Typically they socialize with those other birds um, for quite a long time. And, you know, we go in, we put in a male and a female in each of those clusters and release them, and we put them in particular clusters. We also have extra clusters ready to go, because I can tell you, even though we play matchmaker, they never stay together, and they never stay in the cluster you release them. Even when you have really high success, the first year, 80% retention. None of the birds stayed in the clusters we put them in, and none of the birds stayed paired like we had them. But uh, that's fine, we, you know. We just got to give them opportunity to do so. So the main way we've got birds, uh, get birds to warm prairies through translocation. But we've also had another method. I, we talked earlier, I was out doing surveys for translocation in the fall in September one year. I came across this bird, had a red cap, tells me it's a young male. And one thing you notice, no color bands. All of our birds, all of our young birds that had fledged had been color banded. So this bird, moved in from another site. We don't know where, but we actually had a bird that fall and another unbanded bird that spring moved in. I came out less than a week later and I, I trapped this bird and banded it. We had in that same cluster, ironically, a bird that was banded from Morrill Big Pine, which is about 30 miles away. So um, pretty, pretty long distance. I believe we've had one other bird that has moved in uh, to Warren Prairie. Oh yeah, a bird from Pine City of all things from uh, a bird from Pine City Natural Area came in um, uh, and actually someone got really good pictures of the color bands uh, uh, with less a week later after, after I first spotted it. It, it uh, nest, successfully nested one year, fledged some birds. So we got some of the Pine City genes into the population, which is pretty neat. So we've done this, these translocations over the years and you can see we've had pretty good success um, and up until our last tr translocation, we had 60% retention rate. And these are the birds that we recited. There's a good chance, a very good chance that there are birds that did not settle in a cluster that floated around and may still be floating around of these other birds. And so, in fact, for this one, quite cer certain that this number is actually three or maybe even four. I had a bird that uh, never could get complete color bands on. But what I did get suggested it was from us, um, that year. The one year we really had bad success was our last one. And we're going to repeat the uh, translocation to some of that area. There's a couple of things to note on that. So this was done in 2019. We know what happened in the spring of 2020. We had the pandemic hit. And it really affected our, uh, our monitoring efforts. And so basically all we did in the spring of 2020 is to, did all the monitoring that you needed to then color band birds and then get the sex of the birds that fledge. Um, that's the main thing. You need to keep all your, your birds as well as possible completely. You need all your population uh, banded. 
and you, you have to have them banded to be an, uh, if you want to be a recipient of translocation. So, you know, it's part of that. What was interesting though, we had four clusters we released birds in. Two of those clusters had birds in, and one of them successfully uh, had two that fled young. It was like, I know we have at least one, you know, one or two birds, but there were all birds that had previously fledged from Warren Prairie from previous years and they'd gone in uh, and they're still there. Um, and so one, one of those is a single bird and we will match a single female from the Kasachi with it. And that often is very successful. So, you know, I really don't like that number. Uh, it's probably not completely accurate because our monitoring was not complete, but, um, you know, that's what I have to report. And still, even with that, our, you know, our success so far is 51% uh, retention rate. And again, it's probably higher than that. This is our, our success uh, nesting from that time. Our first nest season was 2011. Um, one thing to note, PBGs are potential breeding groups. So you can have a pair, but not all pairs nest within a year. BGs, as I call it, which is not a real term, but I call it that. So those are the actual breeding groups. And then this is success, six, number of successful breeding groups, and then the number of young fledged. SBGs are single bird groups, and that sounds silly, but they are actually very important. They, if it's a male, they will stick in that cluster for a long time waiting for a female to move in. So you keep managing that habitat, eventually you'll get a pair, and that will help you increase your population. So one thing you can see over time, this has been increasing through a combination of translocations and natural recruitment. And we've kind of hit this area over the last few years where we've been anywhere from 11 to 13 active groups. And you can see we've been fledging over the last four years, 12 to 14 birds. That, this, this, one was, this number was a little disappointing this year because we had our highest number of nest attempts, but we don't, didn't have but five successful nests. And I'll talk more about that while I speculate what's going on there. We also see an important thing is group size because those, those helper males in your population are kind of like your insurance policy. So when you know the, the breeding male dies, then you got you already have a male that can take over there, although the breeding female will disperse at that point because it's the the breed, that's the uh, helper male's mother. So she will disperse um, to avoid inbreeding. But um, but also they can replace you know adjacent clusters if a breeding male dies. And so those are really important. So that group size is really important. We got it up to 2.7, it declined a little bit. Um, it's still at a healthy size, but I would like to get that a little uh, higher. Our short-term goal is 10 to 12 potential breeding groups. Our five-year average is this point is 9.6, which is the same as last year. And we're hoping with this translocation that can help us get enough, you know, kind of get over that hump to where we're averaging over 10 potential breeding groups and where we can get the number of fledged birds a little bit higher. And, and we're right on the edge of it. Each year says, oh, we're almost there. Um, and I, I saw this same kind of pattern happen at Morrill Big Pond. It's like, wow, you know, I, everything with RCWs takes a lot of patience. But finally, they got there. In 2020, they had an incredible recruitment year. And they've had good ones before that. So it took them a little time, but they, they, did, they did get there. And we're just right behind that same pattern. But I talked about the poor nest success this year. And actually, we saw that um, at Morrill Big Pond and also in Union County um, at the population that the Nature Conservancy manages and part of that's on our property. Um, and we all had low nest success rate. The number of birds fledged from each successful nest was good, but the number of uh, the percentage of nests that were successful were low. And I speculate part of that is because of the February we had. Uh, you know, in Little Rock, we were way below normal temperatures and we were below normal for a very long time. You know, we started off with a, with a sleet storm and then we had a snowstorm and then we had another snowstorm. And so, and then th this is in our neighborhoods. Uh, we were out walking the dog, it's a 10 acre lake, completely iced over. Um, and, you know, we saw a lot of birds suffer from that. A lot of birds that forage on the ground. People in South Arkansas were reporting to me all these dead bluebirds in the, uh, their nest boxes. And I was a little concerned about the, the uh, RCWs, although bluebirds have a very different foraging behavior than RCWs. RCWs forage on the, on the side of trees, which largely were not covered with the snow, whereas bluebirds 
are a little bit like a red-tailed hawk. They perch and drop. They forage on insects on the ground or they eat, they're eating berries. And so most of their habitat was covered with snow, the, the bluebirds, and their alternative, uh, their other food resource in the winter, the berries, were quickly stripped because nothing could get anything in the ground. So everything was going for the berries. So I think that's why we saw, why we saw so many dead bluebirds. But I think it also affected the RCWs because they probably, you know, their, their body weight may have been a little bit lower as they entered nest season. Maybe they needed to spend a little more time foraging for themselves, you know, so their, their health was maybe not as optimal as it would be in a typical year. And it affected the amount they had to forage on their own. We had all these populations had a lot of interruptions from Southern flying squirrels coming in and getting in the cavities. And once they sit on the nestlings or eggs, you know, the, they'll do that for a day or two and that, that nest fails. Um, and so if the bird, if the adults weren't having to forage so much for themselves, I think they would be closer to the nest and able to defend those nests from the flying squirrels more readily. That's my speculation. These are the two big problems for, uh, for RCWs. This is the black rat snake. This was in a cavity. I think it took both the eggs and the adult of that nest and the, the, the female. And then this is a flying squirrel. And so they, do, they can do a couple of things. One, they displace RCWs from using that cavity from roosting in there. So they're more subject to the elements or to owls and so forth. And also, like I mentioned, they sometimes, the flying squirrels will move around. They'll come in and use a, a RCW cavity for say a nest cavity for a couple of days, but it's just long enough that it keeps the birds from incubating or feeding young and you end up with a nest failure. Uh, so the Warren Prairie is now up to 6,221 acres. Um, it was 4,660 acres in 2010 when we started the repatriation projects. It was 761 acres when I started in 2000. So we are progressively and actively adding to it. In fact, we added this 630 acres um, in uh, November of last year. We currently have 18 cluster sites. 12 of those are active. These yellow dots are where we're going to release birds this year. This particular one has a single male. We'll put a female in there. Uh, we have natural cavities and active cavities in there. These different colors just represent a different type of habitat management going on, just, just really depicts on it. It's a very active management site. Uh, a lot of restoration going on there. Uh, a lot of these redder ones, these are younger stands, but we're restoring those, we're opening those up. Be good for uh, a variety of uh, biodiversity. Pine City area, as I mentioned, is the only uh, site anywhere within the Mississippi alluvial plains, also called the Delta, has RCWs. At the time, 500 square miles of, was a mosaic of habitat that included extensive areas of Lavalley Pond, and, and that's centered on Monroe County. We currently have four active groups there, which is really small. We're restoring a habitat for a fifth pair, and I've got another spot for a sixth pair in mind. But for context, we were down to three birds in 2001 and all those were, were related. We ended up translocating one of those females to the Washita where it bred and the bird we got bred and it got us going again. So um, that the population is doing better, but it's got a ways to go. Uh, again, these are the populations. Ross Foundation did have them over there by uh, Gurdon, but it looks like that population is, uh, no, is no longer extant. So Pine City has four groups. Warren Prairie has 12 groups. The Felsenthal National Wildlife Refuge has done a wonderful job growing their population from like 14, 15 groups up to uh, 24 groups now. The Nature Conservancy has uh, a habitat conservation area right here. It's a regulatory thing. It was under Plum Creek. They bought the land. And we've since bought, I think it's 1,300 acres there and gave a fish on some of that property. But the Nature Conservancy manages the property and the birds, so they're up to 24. More old big pine, up to 31. And again, that that uh, I believe when when they really started doing that, they were in the single digits. Uh, and so all the habitat work is really paying off. Washington National Forest has about 70 groups. I talked to Warren Montague a couple of day, get, days ago. He, he says it's still around 70 groups. They don't do as active of monitoring as they used to do, so they don't know the exact numbers. But it appears. Their, their population is good number and in good shape. Sounds like a lot of birds, you know, we, we often say this is a large population, but technically 
a large population is anything over 100 uh, potential breeding groups. Um, at one time, I used to say, you know, I'd make this point, hey, we have just enough bird for one large population. But fortunately, thanks to all this growth, Warren Prairie, Morrow Big Pine, Felsenthal, we now almost have enough birds statewide for two large populations. So, you know, that's, that's uh, encouraging. Talked about this earlier. So we often refer to RCW as an umbrella species. A lot of things that fall under that umbrella. Uh, we have Henslow sparrows that occur at Warren Prairie Natural Area. It's in the Barrens primarily. Uh, also at Longview, we will have uh, Sling, where we'll have RCWs one day. A lot of other things, a lot of red-headed woodpeckers, diner fiddlery, a lot of rare plants. And this is just kind of a collage of it. One other thing that, close, that grows at uh, Warren Prairie in the really, uh, on the edges of those barrens is jewel carpet minimum. It's a, a, small car, something, a small plant in the carnation family, and it is a federally threatened plant. It's the largest population anywhere is at Warren Prairie Natural Area. Collaboration is key for all that. This is a picture the morning we released birds the first year in 2010. We have folks from the Nature Conservancy from two different timber companies, our staff and our contractor from Georgia. Um, none of our work would be possible without extensive collaboration and partnership, money to buy the land, money to restore the land, manage the property. Uh, move the birds, keep the cavities clean so they're available for RCWs and so forth. Warren Montague is, is one of the big heroes, like I mentioned. Warren trained me. He's going to help us again this year. It's just incredible. Dan Brown, who works for him, also I've worked with Dan a whole lot. He also helped train me. Um, great, great people to work with. And of course, the, the list goes on. And, and the, the list is outside of Arkansas as well. I mean, we have people from Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. We're getting birds from the, the National Forest in Louisiana. Uh, and of course, the Audubon groups have always been strong supporters of what we're doing. Uh, going back before I worked for Natural Heritage Commission, um, Audubon Society of Central Arkansas used, has been helping, um, used to help extensively with uh, monitoring at uh, Pine City Natural Area. If you want any more information on Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, you can go to our website. And uh, I will say we uh, this is a, a new website. It's not, <laughs> it will be incredible one day. It's at this point, not quite as good as the last one, but it's on the verge of being so. Um, if you see any problems with this website, please let us know. But it does have a lot of really good information, including information about our natural areas, what natural areas we have, directions to get there, and so forth, and I encourage you to visit that site. And with that, I think I made it through almost, almost uh, within the time frame I had. Yeah, I'll be happy to take questions if, if uh, anybody wants to ask questions. Thanks, Bill. Uh, there are just a couple of questions in the chat that I'll relay. Um, since you mentioned a shortage of older pines, can you install artificial cavities in younger pines and overcome that lack of older pines? You can, and, that, and that's largely what we're doing in a lot of areas at Warren Prairie. Um, so absolutely. So they need to be, have um, they need to be a, have a diameter of about fourteen inches, I believe, to be big enough. So they have to be big enough that you can put the cavity in there, and obviously for the tree not to fall over at that spot, but also you need to be able to put it in the heartwood because if you're inserting the cavity and if it's, it's uh, you're not, you're putting in part where the sap wood is, that's a live part of the tree and sap can seep into the cavity. So the, the young tree just has to be big enough so you can put the cavity into the heartwood. And it doesn't have to have the red heart fungus, it just, that part of the tree, the heartwood is dead and so it doesn't have sap going through it. Um, so how long does a family group use a nest cavity for as long as the tree is alive? So um, it, it can really vary. You know, I, I don't know that I've looked for this forever, how long a bird even lives. But I know that there, a bird has really high survival rate, RCWs, up to about the age of six, and then it starts declining. So they're fairly long lived. Um, they will use... Um, they will use a cavity for a number of years. One of the limiting factors 
is as they're making these sap wells around the cavity entrance over time, it will actually kill that the face wood around there and sap won't flow down flow out so it won't be able to produce sap to protect the, the birds from the rat snakes the other thing that can happen like any kind of uh cavity nester i mean you can over time get parasites in there um the 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 inside of those trees those cavities will also start decaying they can have water start leaking in them so it can vary but i can tell you they can they can use those artificial cavities four, five, six years, sometimes longer if you keep them in good shape. They can use natural cavities for a good, pretty good while as well. But I'd say in general, they probably use a cavity for like three or four years. Yeah. I will say a, a, a caveat on that. We have a natural cavity at Pine City that was created in the 90s and then abandoned. In fact, Warren Montague and I tried to get some flying squirrels out of it in 2004, I believe, and the the uh, had so much red heart fungus that the had so much rot above the cavity that when we went in to get the flying squirrels, they just went up uh, up inside the tree, so we couldn't get them. Well, over time, the flying squirrels disappeared, and in the last couple of years, the RCWs at that particular spot at Pine City have reactivated that cavity, which is really neat. Uh, that same cluster. In the early 2000s is one where I, doc I had a bird, as, uh, as I mentioned, I don't know exactly how they live on average, but that particular bird, I believe it was either 11 or 12 years old, an wow. old male. Yeah, very, very, very cool. Um, typically, they don't live that long, but um, they can. Okay, so it's time for one more question. Anyone else want to get their, their prescribed burning question out? Well, I'll just ask one more then. Uh, have, are there any genetic studies to go along with translocations to show they're having the desired effect of keeping the genetic population diverse? Um, there, there is some work that's been done. I don't know if it was specifically to, to address that question, but there has been some genetic work, work done range-wide um, to look at genetic variation across the different populations and to compare large populations to smaller populations and the genetic health in those, but not as far as I know to address that question. But I will tell you one of the things the, on, the, on the translocation rules, so they have two cooperatives. They have a Western cooperative that's everything west of the Mississippi, and then they have one that's called the Southern Cooperative. This is kind of goofy, but it's everything east of the Mississippi. So you cannot translocate a bird from one cooperative area to the other currently. They are looking at that possibly, but they are concerned that, for example, if we were to move a bird from Florida, which would be an incredible translocation, but the genetics may be different enough that it, it's not a good match for the climate and so forth here. Mm -hmm. um, and so at this point, they, they are discussing that and additional genetics. So for, for example, maybe, so they would probably approve it if we really need it from Mississippi, for example. Uh, or maybe Alabama, but but at this point you would have to get special permission, so that that's not happening. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for sharing uh, all your knowledge and all your many years of dedicated work to this endangered species with all of us. I really appreciate it.